morning. I thank your pastor, who is a dear friend, uh, Pastor Brim McPhail, for the opportunity to minister God's word with you this morning. I know Pastor Brim to be a skilled and verse-by-verse -verse preacher. Today I've been led to preach about preaching. Some of you may do some preaching, and I would venture to say that all of you regularly listen to preaching. How should you listen to a sermon? Does God's word give us any help on that? Turn with me in your Bibles to the book of Acts, chapter 10, one verse, verse 33. Acts 10, verse 33. I'll read it with you. So I sent for you at once, and you have been kind enough to come. Now, therefore, we are all here in the presence of God to hear all that you have been commanded by the Lord. Of course, we need to have a context on this single verse to know what was going on previous to the revelation of the action that the verse depicts. Well, what had been going on prior to verse 33 in the book of Acts is that the gospel in the baby church had expanded out from Jerusalem and into Gentile country. Further, God had given a vision to a Gentile turned Jew who was a military leader, and his name was Cornelius. In that vision, God told Cornelius to call for a man named Peter. And Cornelius sent men to bring Peter back to him. And then... Cornelius waited for Peter to come to him with a message from God. Cornelius was so eager to hear that sermon that he called together plenty of his family members and his friends, close relatives, so they could hear the sermon too. This is the background of Acts 10, verse 33, which I will read again. So, Cornelius speaking to Peter, So I sent for you at once, and you've been kind enough to come. Now, therefore, we are all here in the presence of God to hear all that you have been commanded by the Lord. You are here today, this beautiful Lord's Day in mid-August 2022, and hopefully you are here every Lord's Day through the calendar year, here to worship the Lord in spirit and in truth, but also here to hear a sermon a Bible-based sermon. So how should you listen to this sermon, and how should you listen to all of Pastor Bryn's sermons through the year? How should you listen to a sermon? Well, the first point in the text that I want us to see is that we should be eager to hear sermons. In the text, it's Cornelius told Peter, so I sent for you at once. In the vision, he was told to send for Peter, and at once... He sent for the Apostle Peter to come to him because he wanted to hear the sermon. We should be eager to hear sermons. I've had the minister privilege to minister the Word of God in northern Thailand. And I can remember being in a tribal setting with houses all on stilts. And the villagers spread the word that a pastor was coming from the United States to preach God's Word on a particular Lord's Day. And the villagers started coming and walking to the hut that we were going to be worshiping God in and hearing a sermon. And I watched them filing toward me. Some of them looked weary. Some of them looked hot. Some of them looked exhausted. And I turned to my host and I said, how far do they have to walk to hear a sermon? And he said, miles. They walked miles every Sunday to hear a sermon. They were eager. Or I think of the privilege I had of teaching at the seminary in northern India where the student body were mostly Hindus who had converted to Christ. What that means in the Hindu family structure is if you turn to Jesus Christ in faith and repentance and belief and become a Christian, you are disowned by your family. They want nothing more to do with you. And so as I looked upon the class, as I taught the books of Jeremiah and Isaiah in the seminary, I saw individuals, young individuals, men and women, who had been disowned by their parents, in some cases tortured and abused by their villages they came from to come to the seminary. And there they were, 
so eager to hear anything I would teach them from God's word, any sermon I might provide? Are we eager each week to hear sermons? Are we excited not to hear from Pastor Bryn or from Pastor Rob Elliott today, but to hear from God through his servant? Or is it SOF, same old stuff? Every week we just trundle, trundle in here, you sit down, there's a sermon, when is it going to be over? Lunch is in the oven. Shouldn't be SOS. It should be SOS, not same old stuff, but it should be SOS, Scripture only satisfied. Do you believe that? That Scripture only satisfies. If we believe that, we'll be eager to hear every sermon that's preached in this pulpit. I've had the great privilege of preaching God's word to four congregations in three countries over 35 years. <laughs> and in the time of doing that, I've seen yes faces and I have seen no faces. I've seen persons on the edge of their pews wanting to hear the sermon, and I have seen people sleep completely through a sermon. On one occasion, I was at the back door greeting the church family after a particular sound sleeper had slept through my entire sermon. He shook my hand at the end and said, oh, Pastor, that was a fine sermon. <laughs> <laughs> I thought, really? Wow. So in the first place, we must be eager to hear sermons. The second thing, from the same verse, we should be in awe, A-W-E. We should be in awe as we hear sermons. Cornelius told Peter in our verse, we are all here in the presence of God. That's what brings awe to listening to a sermon. We are all here in the presence of God. <laughs> you are not to, certainly not to be in awe of me as I'm preaching as I'm a human being with flaws. You are certainly not to be in awe of your wonderful pastor, Brim McPhail, because he's flawed as well. But you are to be in awe of the experience of hearing a preacher preach the word of God in the power of the Holy Spirit with accuracy and application. Matthew Simpson, in his book, Lectures on Preaching, wrote this of the preacher. Simpson wrote this of the preacher. Ready? Quote, his throne is pulpit. He stands in Christ's stead. His message is the word of God. Around him are immortal souls. The Savior, unseen, is beside him. The Holy Spirit broods over the congregation. Angels gaze upon the scene, and heaven and hell await the issue. That is true, end of quote. That is why whenever we come to this place or any other place to hear a sermon, that we should be in awe of God. Again, Simpson, the preacher's throne is pulpit. He stands in Christ's stead. His message is the word of God. Around him are immortal souls. The Savior, unseen, is beside him. The Holy Spirit broods over the congregation. Angels gaze upon the scene. And heaven and hell await the issue. So Acts 10, second part of the one verse again. Now, therefore, Cornelius said to Peter. Now, Therefore, we are all here in the presence of God. May I interject? Being in awe of God to hear all that you have been commanded by the Lord. So, so far in this half verse, we've seen two responsibilities that each of us have as we listen to a sermon. Responsibility number one is be eager to hear the sermon. And responsibility number two is be in awe of God as we hear the sermon. There's a third responsibility. When it comes to hearing sermons, the third responsibility in the text is that we should get others to hear sermons too. We should get others to hear sermons too. Cornelius said to Peter, we are all here. Cornelius didn't take the approach, well, I'm going to get a special apostolic message from Peter just for me, myself, and I. No, he gathered his family. He gathered his friends. And it says in the text, there were many people assembled in his house. We should get others to hear sermons too. 
It says in verses 24 to 27, prior to the verse we're looking at, that Cornelius gathered many persons to hear whatever sermon Peter was going to preach. I love that. Peter, Peter assembled a crowd, not for a party, not for a restaurant reservation, not for a yard sale. He gathered plenty of persons to simply hear a sermon. How appropriate it would be for each of us every week to get others to hear your pastor's sermons too. Cornelius put together a crowd for a sermon. I love it. So I ask, when was the last time you invited or you brought persons to this place to worship God and to hear a sermon from Pastor McPhail? One of the good reasons that we should get others to listen to sermons as well as us is that sermons cause needful and positive change in those who truly hear them and apply them. Biblical, Holy Spirit-empowered sermons are like a pebble in your shoe. You surely notice them, and they definitely cause you to do something. The old-time country preacher Vance Havner had it right. Comfort the afflicted, and they afflict the comfortable. So far, we've seen three responsibilities when listening to a sermon. We should be eager to hear sermons. We should be in awe of God as we hear sermons. And we should get others to hear sermons, too. In Acts, one more responsibility as it pertains to us as we hear sermons. We should be open, open as we hear sermons. Cornelius said to Peter, Now therefore, we are all here in the presence of God, watch it now, to hear all that you have been commanded by the Lord. To hear all. You know, there are some places that are appropriately very restricted access places. Police cars. Hospital operating rooms. Restaurant kitchens. Airport runways. There are certain places that are appropriately very restrictive as to how you get into them. Or if you get into them. But there's one place that should never be restricted for entrance. It's the believer's heart when he or she is listening to a sermon. When a believer in Christ is listening to a Bible-based, spirit-empowered sermon, that believer's heart must not be restricted access for the Holy Spirit to get in. Your heart and my heart, when we're listening to a sermon, the Holy Spirit must find our hearts wide open to truth, wide open to repentance, wide open to faith, wide open to obedience. When you are listening to a sermon, you must leave your heart wide open to the Holy Spirit, convicting you, calling you, changing you. The Holy Spirit should always find your heart's door wide open to Him when you're listening to a sermon and every other time in your redeemed life as well. Amen? And so on your heart as you hear a sermon, no pin number, no lock, no door security cages, no password, no sign saying close, come back later. No security guard sitting on a stool. Your heart, every time you hear a sermon, should be wide open to the Holy Spirit. Every Sunday. In one Canadian church which I pastored 
husband and a wife at the end came through to shake my hand on their way out to their week. The man said to me, thanks, pastor. That sermon will do my wife a lot of good. <laughs> you know what? He was joking. But he speaks, I'm afraid, for plenty of people who are serious. People who have some kind of an attitude that when they come and sit in a sanctuary and hear a pastor preach a portion of scripture, they have a big satellite dish on their heads and they bounce the truth over to Mrs. McGillicuddy. Oh, that's good for Mr. Smith. They just bounce God's truth away from themselves to others that they think needs the message. Don't do that. Well, you say, okay, Pastor, Rob, um, I, you're making the point from the text that I should have a certain openness in my heart, a wide openness in my heart, and the word of God is being preached. I, I buy that, but can you help me further? Could you help me with how to do that? How do I consistently present my heart wide open to the Holy Spirit when Pastor McPhail preaches God's word Sunday by Sunday? How, what are practical ways I could do that, Pastor? I'm glad you asked. Number one, get a good night's sleep on Saturday nights. Number two, listen to praise and worship music through the week and on your drive to church on Sunday morning. Number three, make it your goal every Sunday that after the sermon you could go to a six-year-old person in your imagination and explain the gist of the sermon to the six-year-old every Sunday. Listen so that you could explain the gist of the sermon to a six-year-old. Dr. Charles Ryrie was the head of systematic theology at Dallas Theological Seminary, the seminary that Beth and I graduated from. He had a double-earned PhD. Brilliant. Seminary in those days gave Mondays off to the faculty and the students, so every Tuesday was the first time we were in session in our class. Tuesday, Dr. Ryrie asked the students on the Tuesday morning, how was your weekend? And some of them said, we did this or that, it was a good weekend. And one of the students said to Dr. Ryrie, um, how was your weekend, sir? He said, oh, my weekend was great. I went to the inner city projects and taught theology to children. Dr. Charles Ryrie, double earned PhD, head of systematic theology, one of the most leading and respected evangelical seminaries in America. You taught theology to children in the projects. Dr. Ryrie, may, may we ask, why would you do that, sir? He said, because if I can teach theology to six-year-olds, to ten-year-olds in the projects of Dallas, then I might have a shot at teaching you theology. You listen to the sermons and challenge yourself to get the gist of the sermon that you can explain with accuracy the sermon to a six-year-old child. Or, take notes. See, your bulletin has a little spot for you to take notes. Each sermon, take notes. Or, pray about your sermon notes after the service before Monday. Make it your habit that before you roll out of bed on Monday morning, that you go over the sermon notes you wrote for Sunday and think and review them. Or, by Wednesday, phone someone else who heard the sermon and share what God has said to your heart from that sermon and how God is changing you. So before you wake up tomorrow morning, my challenge is you review the notes that you've been taking on this sermon. And my challenge is by Wednesday of this week, you phone someone else, look around, who's here to hear the sermon, phone them up and say, hey, Pastor Elliot's sermon was on listening to a sermon. This is what he's taught me, and this is what I'm, the difference it's going to make in my life. And then turn to the person you phone and say, what, what do you learn from the sermon, and how is it going to change your life? We need to open our hearts wide to biblical sermons. No one else is going to open your heart wide to a sermon. Your wife isn't going to do it for you. Your pastor isn't going to do it for you. Only you can choose to open your own heart wide to a sermon. Only you can choose to do that. God give you grace to do that. Choose that. 
You know, someone has said that spiritually prepared persons are in awe of God and they're never bored listening to a sermon. I believe that's true. So four things about listening to sermon, real quick. Be eager to hear sermons. Be in awe as you hear a sermon. Get others to hear sermons too. Be open as you hear a sermon. Now I want to close this sermon with some things from the same half verse, which are for me as a preacher, but I'll let you in on God speaking to me, okay? These things are for Pastor Brim McPhail as your preacher pastor. These things that I'm going to share now are for every preacher, but we're going to let you in that are not preachers into what God's telling us as preachers, all right? Again, the verse, Cornelius to Peter, Now therefore we are all here in the presence of God to hear, watch now, to hear all that you have been commanded by the Lord. To hear all, preacher, that you have been commanded by the Lord. When preaching honors the Lord, it's obeying something God has commanded to the preacher to preach. I like to say it's like God in heaven makes the motion... And the preacher seconds the motion and brings the carried motion to the people for their vote. Will the motion carry with God's people? My job is to second God's motion, first found in his word, to present it to you every Sunday and for you to vote. Will you carry God's motion? Or another metaphor, God cooks the nutritious meal, the gourmet nutritious meal from his word for each Sunday. God cooks the meal and the preacher is the waiter who brings the meal that God cooked to the diners. And my job is just not to drop it or bring it cold. Being a preacher is serious stuff. Good and faithful preachers, like your pastor, good and faithful preachers work hard on studying and writing and praying and rewriting over their weekly sermons. If done right, listen now carefully, if done right, every week, Sermon research and writing can take between 30 to 60 minutes of work through the week for every one minute of a spoken sermon on a Sunday. Did you hear me? It could take a pastor 30 to 60 minutes of research, prayer, and writing for every minute he speaks publicly from a pulpit in a sermon. That means that for... 30-minute sermon, the preacher may research and write and pray for between 15 and 30 hours in the week, Monday to Saturday. It's like an iceberg. <laughs> there is so much, much more unseen of the iceberg underneath the water than the seen of the iceberg above the water. And if the time ratios that I've mentioned imply something, they imply this, that for an average 30-minute sermon, between only 1.5% and 3% of the Monday to Saturday prep time is seen and heard in the pulpit. And between 97% and 98.5% of the Monday to Saturday prep time is not seen or heard as the sermon is delivered. Watch this now. The preacher who is willing to live and work with those time ratios is humble and faithful. And he is all about pleasing his Lord and not necessarily about pleasing his congregation. So please know this. In those 15 to 30 hours of weekly sermon preparation and prayer, the conscientious preacher is figuring out exactly with God what God commands him to preach the next Sunday. My Canadian friend Len McKenzie told me once that good preaching is like a hen scratching out food in the ground. And then the chicks can come by and find food and eat. Usually that scratching in the Bible takes a great deal of effort and time by the preacher. Now ladies, I apologize for this analogy in advance. I know it's only a small reflection, but maybe you could say in a small, very small way, delivering a sermon is like delivering a baby. Well, in seminary, my wife and all the other wives of the men training for the ministry as pastors were told 
don't criticize your husband's sermon on the drive home back from Sunday worship. Don't criticize a newborn baby to his or her mother in the hospital delivery room. If you have just delivered a beautiful little baby you're so proud of, Mom, if you've just delivered such a baby, how would you feel if after several months no one ever bothered to come by the house to meet the baby? How would you feel worse if they did come by the house but then ignored the baby and just watched their watch when the visit could be over? Steve Lawson says, quote, it matters to God what is preached, and it matters to him how it is preached. No man is free to preach whatever and however he so chooses, and that is true, end of quote. Proper preaching doesn't make the preacher popular. The founder of Apple Computers, Steve Jobs, who is by no means a Christian, has given us a worthwhile leadership principle. Jobs says, if you want to make everyone happy, don't be a leader sell ice cream. I'm here to tell you that a faithful, diligent, submitted, humble, and holy preacher is not not a seller of ice cream. Proper preaching, God-honoring preaching, isn't for person-pleasing yes-men who are timid, insecure, and easily intimidated. In fact, preachers who are fearful about being disliked or rejected are like sailboats on a windless day. They're going nowhere, and everyone stuck on board with them are stuck in place. On the contrary, on the other hand, sold out to God preachers are like shuttle trains in an airport terminal. They call you to swiftly hop on board or get out of the way for those who will swiftly hop on board. John Wesley knew the power of reverent and bold preachers. This is what he said. Give me a hundred preachers who fear nothing but sin and desire nothing but God. Such alone will shake the gates of hell. End quote. That's true. Proper preaching doesn't tickle ears proper preaching turns hearts to God. And therefore, proper preaching is preached by a faithful preacher, a hard-working preacher, a courageous preacher, an obedient preacher, and a following orders from God preacher. I believe you have that kind of preacher in Brimley Faith. I believe you have just that kind of So you know what you must do? Because you have that kind of a preacher, you must love him. You must pray for him. You must encourage him. You must pay him. You must respect him. You must copy him as he copies Christ. You must stand under him as he stands under Christ. You must obey him as he obeys Christ. And you must hear and heed him as he preaches biblical truth. Acts 10, 33b, one more time. Now, therefore, we are all here in the presence of God to hear all that you have been commanded by the Lord. Acts 10, 33b, packs a punch. It gives the right way to listen to a sermon and the right way to preach a sermon. God help us.